good morning, uh, good day, wherever you're joining us from virtually, but it's fantastic to see a crowd here in person. Uh, I want to say a thank you to Richard and to Greg for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's really an honor to get to talk to this kind of a community where I think there's so much alignment and so many intersections between the type of work that myself and my teams do uh, with the work that you're doing every day. So I'm excited to kind of take a walk down memory lane here uh, in terms of sharing some stories about the history of incident response. Uh, now my starting point's gonna be for the last 20 years, so not, not prior to that, but I'm gonna share uh, you know, a number of stories and then really look forward to Q&A where we can get much more interactive. That said, if you uh, at any point wanna interrupt, ask a question as we're talking, happy to do that too. Uh, so, uh, and you know, I titled this presentation, you know, before cyber was a career, um, because obviously many of us are familiar with the word and the term. And if you're, you know, a military operator today, for example, there's an entire um, within every branch, entire, uh, you know, career field and multiple derivative options from that. Um, certainly, for those of us in the private sector or the commercial world lots and lots of opportunity, um, but there was a time where cyber wasn't a thing and it wasn't a career journey. And so um, I think as you can see by this photo, uh, my hair is always done really poorly in humidity, so we'll see how it goes today being in Texas and, and live. Uh, but I wanna take you back to when I started which, uh, in this field, which was in 2002, uh, and I started in the US Air Force. I was stationed at Los Angeles Air Force Base, actually, and if any of you have ever been there, you might say, well, I didn't know there was a base there. Um, and most people don't, actually. You could live five minutes away your whole life and not know there's a base, because there's actually not a runway, so it's not a traditional Air Force Base, uh, certainly not a Texas-style Air Force Base, let's say that. Um, but it was a really good opportunity for me to uh, get my feet wet in forensic analysis, in understanding cyber operations, what kind of work we were doing to support counterintelligence and counterterrorism missions. Um, if you remember back to 2002, uh, at this time Tom Brady was just winning his first Super Bowl MVP. Uh, if we can go back to a time where he w was pre-retirement, you know, four or five times. And the Air Force was actually flying missions over U.S. airspace um, at post 9-11. And, uh, you know, when we were putting this presentation together, it kind of took me back a minute to think, wow, yeah, that was, that was a thing. You know, certainly for myself and my teams, we were concerned about the war going on, about what was going to happen, how we were, you know, being impacted, what that would mean for our personal lives for sure. Uh, as well as obviously what was going on throughout the world. And so a lot of that time was spent uh, working on defense missions and identifying uh, attackers and intruders who were uh, venturing into our systems and certainly looking to steal information and um, you know, potentially put a lot of lives in danger. Uh, so really was a good opportunity for me to uh, get exposure to the field and one of the elements that became incredibly clear very quickly was that um, we didn't speak the same language. So I came to an office where there are about 50 different uh, special agents uh, doing counterintelligence, doing regular crimes like drugs, murders, thankfully we don't have too much of that in the Air Force, but uh, regular criminal elements as well as fraud, and then going into counterterrorism. And I was one of two people that was a computer crime investigator. And I realized that my, uh, my boss, and I know many of you probably know him, but um, Chad Tilbury, you know, he's a big SANS instructor, teaches a lot of courses. Um, he and I were the only ones that spoke the same language. No one else had any clue what we were talking about. And in fact, when I applied for that job, so I applied to be a special agent, and then I applied for the specialty of computer crime intelligence, the recruiter actually told me like, Mm, no, I, you probably don't want to do that. And I'm like, well, why would I not want to do that? I have a computer science degree. I've been studying for this. Um, and it was, well, because only nerds do that job, All right? And so I'm like, well, I'm a nerd too. Like, I, don't, I guess you're thinking I look a certain way and making a judgment based on that, but I really want to do that job. And I say that because then I got to the office and I mentioned Chad and I were the only people that really you know, spoke the same language. Our boss was a you know, former counterintelligence agent, never had background in computer crime. 
And, uh, you know, that our coworkers would joke and say, why do you guys even carry a gun? Because, uh, you know, what are you going to do, shoot a keyboard? Uh, right? And so we got, like, all of this kind of harassment, um, you know, certainly um, well-intentioned most of the time, uh, but harassment from our coworkers. And uh, to me, it uh, really represented that there was a bigger problem. And it was, wow, if they don't understand the criticality of these problems, then we're in trouble. Uh, and so, you know, one of the first cases that I worked was a defense industrial uh, base, so a defense contractor, who essentially had a theft in the, let's just say it was 200 gigabytes at the time. I think it was quite a bit more. But we did the math, right? And ultimately, you know, I'm talking to my boss and saying, hey, they just stole, and in this case it was a nation state actor, um, and we had proof that, hey, they stole this amount of data. And he's like, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like, what does 100 gigabytes of data even mean? And so I had to translate what that would be in actual, like, printed out, you know, 8 by 11 size paper and how high that would stack up. And, you know, he's like, oh, that's a problem. I'm like, yeah, this is a huge problem. And this kind of theft is occurring, right, on a daily basis, uh, you know, in many cases. And there was also this, um, something that will come into play is a concept between classified information and not classified. And so thinking that, well, but it's unclassified data that was stolen. And I said, yes, but imagine if you're a foreign intelligence agency uh, and you understand how procurement works for, let's say, like aircraft systems, and you know that it's un everything starts out as unclassified, and you have a pocket of data here, and a pocket there, and a pocket there, and maybe this coming from this company and this part supplier. If I steal all of it, um, then I have the whole program schematics, right? I don't have to go to the classified systems and steal it once it's all compiled together. So uh, it was clear to me that if we couldn't effectively communicate um, to my boss, who certainly understood, you know, the spy game, that if he didn't understand that the battlefield had moved to cyberspace, um, then we were not only going to have problem combating our adversaries, but we were certainly not going to get funding for tools, for training, for other types of support needed in order to be able to effectively defend our environments. And so um, I spent, on active duty, I spent just under five years. Uh, I traveled the world, maybe a little more than I wanted to at the time, right? I spent a ton of time uh, overseas and deployed. And so I made the choice uh, uh, just before five years to get out and separate and move into the private sector. And, you know, initially I was concerned that, you know, hey, am I, I have the, a job with like the coolest mission in the world, basically, and I get paid to carry a gun. Like, this is awesome, right? Um, but, I, I, so I was concerned that I'm going to lose that. What I also realized, though, and specifically because we had done so much work with commercial organizations, with the FBI, many of our cases were run in conjunction with them, I realized that um, the only way we were ever going to look to solve this problem was to really have joint partnerships between public and private sector and to really leverage the power of both of those in order to, to be successful. So I left the Air Force uh, in 2006. Uh, joined what was this tiny little boutique company at the time, uh, which was Mandiant, and obviously they're, as of today, they're now Google. Uh, and uh, ultimately, what was clear was that uh, this was no longer a military problem or even just a defense industrial-based problem, but this was becoming, right, much, much bigger. And so I would say, so now we're kind of shifting into uh, the 2007 timeframe and really looking at a threat landscape that's changed where, uh, you know, there were some real benefits to being in the private sector. We could make some decisions faster, we could execute on certain missions more quickly, and we could actually share information back in a way uh, with the military, with the government, in a way that helped out. Um, but it was really clear that the attackers uh, were far in advance of us nearly every step of the way. Uh, they had a different set of rules. They had no jurisdiction challenges and legal challenges between uh, the different ent entities, uh, and they were able to move a lot faster than we were. And we, at the time, didn't have the level of tools that we have today, right, to conduct analytics, to really answer questions really quickly. 
And um, we didn't, we certainly, I mean, today we're still very challenged in having enough trained and skilled resources, which is why events like this are so critical to make sure right, we're rapidly sharing information and best practices and new uses for the tool that other people might not even be aware of. Um, at that time, we were really slow. So going back to 2007, you know, we're looking at uh, an environment where uh, we're sharing threat indicators via paper, like literally typing spreadsheets out or printing out a spreadsheet um, by hand, FET, putting it in a FedEx envelope and, so, uh, and sharing information that way. And if it was classified, because uh, at this time we have uh, you know, the onset of organizations like the NCIJTF, which is the National Counterintelligence, the Joint Task Force, uh, that's sharing a lot of cyber information now at this point, but it was legitimately uh, you know, spreadsheets of indicators, many of them IP addresses and email addresses. So you, can, you all, I think, can appreciate you know, the level of enriched data you have today to be able to search through and make analytical decisions. Uh, and we're you know, having to transpose these um, by hand because the information was classified. So when, organi when someone received it, which like FedEx, you know, maybe best case is gonna take a day or two, uh, and then from there, they're gonna have to kind of type it into new systems and then be able to query it at scale. Uh, you can see this is a huge recipe for disaster. Uh, so as a transition into the private sector, one of the first cases that we worked um, also involved uh, two defense contractors. And in, uh, in this space, I no notice I mentioned two, uh, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with these kind of big contracts where, uh, you know, companies will pull together and then work on a proposal for in some cases a year or more for these major systems. And you've got all kinds of data going back and forth and uh, ultimately a lot of information that has to be compiled to then submit the final proposal. And what we saw was that uh, an organization, so we got a call from a defense contractor and they said, well, hey, uh, I received, so the person who called us, you know, I, I lead the bid and proposal team for my defense contractor, A, and I received an email from my previous uh, teammate who is now my competitor who leads the bid and proposal team for company B, and the email was titled, you know, and when I opened it, it was titled that company's final proposal for this bid. So generally, you know, not some behavior that's going to occur, right, where I send my team's proposal to my competitor before it's submitted. So the recipient was like, hmm, I actually know this person because we used to work together. I'm gonna call them. Because um, this is, it, what they actually thought was that that person made an error. Like, oh my God, they sent me this deck and like he's gonna lose his job. If that's the case, I'm gonna give him a heads up and I'm not gonna open the file. So you probably know where this is going in that he called his former coworker, said, man, like you sent me this proposal, why'd you do that? What are you talking about? I didn't send you any email. Uh, and he's like, yeah, you did. And it's this huge file, it looks like it's your proposal. So the guy was like, I didn't send you anything, um, you know, goes in to his email and there was in fact an email sent from his account um, that included what he saw was a legitimate document. So he said, well, I didn't send that, this is a problem. To which then they both reported this. Uh, ultimately, that's how we got the call. And you know, as we went through it, the nation state actor had compromised uh, the sending, e you know, e sending email uh, users company extensively. They had been in there um, for months at this time and had mapped out the entire network, uh, had followed this bid and proposal team uh, and saw exactly what they were doing. And so they knew the politics within the company, they understood how this was working and they were then able to say, well, we don't have access to this company B, so let's craft a scheme that's gonna work. And you know, in terms of an enticing email, I mean, this is not a, a Nigerian scam that we're asking you know, people to avoid. This is a, a legitimate piece of really uh, sexy and you know, rich data that could be of use. And so uh, we only got lucky because these two people knew each other and communicated. And I would say that this type of um, you know, attack probably would be 
depending on the variables, obviously, but you might be asking, well, couldn't the you know, nation state actor have mapped out that these two had already worked together? Well, if you know, you're back in 2007, it's really pre-LinkedIn to the degree that we use it today. And so today, I would think that intelligence agency would have already gone you know, through that and identified and probably used a different route to identify people that you know, wouldn't have known one another. So a um, really interesting case, but I think certainly shows the need for communication between humans and sharing of information as much as possible um, to the degree that it can make us all safer. So as I'm kind of walking you through this journey here, we're gonna now fast forward to 2014. And uh, at this point, we have progressed past FedEx envelopes uh, with sharing of data you know, printouts. We're now at USB. Uh, sticks, right? And I think we're probably even post, you know, some USB sticks given uh, activity that's occurred there. And we're now sharing information much more rapidly and our tools have progressed. Uh, and so I, at this point I'm working for uh, another organization. I moved on to CrowdStrike and we got a call uh, from an organization that was a high tech uh, organization that managed other people's data. And uh, they said, hey, we think we've got a situation. You know, we were reached out to by the FBI uh, and we need to speak with you guys. So we flew on site. Again, this is pre-COVID where, you know, everything is kind of in person and on site. Uh, and we get our team out there and we start getting the initial pieces of data from them. And then we deploy, uh, you know, an EDR technology that's starting to give us a lot more visibility into what's going on. And this organization had, um, I would say, probably better than like any place I've seen in, in depicted in the movies, right, in terms of a command center. They had floor to ceiling screens, um, all kinds of telemetry coming in, and then different team members working on the SOC floor. So our team was you know, embedded with them on the SOC floor and seeing what's going on. And in this case, it was another nation state attacker uh, who had come in and not only were they interested in this company's data, but I mentioned that they managed other clients. So by this point, you know, attackers had really figured out, like, I'm going to go to the most rich sources of data. And in that case, it was, let me go to this company that manages infrastructure for all these other organizations and try to see how many organizations I can get into, how many of their clients. And so by the time we got there, it was pretty rampant. They uh, and th this is very different than today. This was back in the days when attackers, nation state actors would just spray malware everywhere. And there were remote access tools all over systems. And we were talking about hundreds of systems, right? Today, like we're lucky if we find two systems that we can find that kind of malware on. Um, but this was you know, a, a different era. And so we saw what they were doing. We had an understanding of what accounts that they had access to. And then ultimately what their behavior pattern was like when they would get cut off from an account. So we worked with the organization and you know, said, okay, we're gonna have to make some risk-based decisions here. Um, we can cut off their access to what we know about, but we also know they probably have a lot of other accounts and other tooling that we haven't identified yet that they're gonna go to plan B and plan C when we make these decisions. So we talked through it with their leadership. This organization was great. They had their chief operating officer who was running the case with us. Really, you know, talk about a business leader who's able to make effective risk-based decisions. Um, you know, he understood what was going on and what the risk was. At the same time, uh, you know, we were talking to their clients. So I mentioned, you know, managing all this client data. We were getting on the phone with clients and um, providing them notification with our client and saying, you know, hey, here's what we've identified. Like, are, can you guys search for these types of activity in your environment and report back? And it, if you find anything more, can you share it with us? And so we were starting to get telemetry pulled in from a lot of different environments to see. And so we took a calculated risk with the business to decide to shut them down. And in one fell swoop, uh, took out their access to all the accounts we knew about, uh, removed and wiped all of the tooling that they had uh, online. And it literally became a dogfight where we could see them on screen, popping new systems, starting to uh, attempt to execute new, uh, you know, new pieces of malware. 
And what we had done was because we had a different type of visibility at this point. So we could see in line when this was occurring and actually stop executables as they happened. So it gave us this really interesting back and forth opportunity. And we actually pulled in, not from my team, but from other teams, developers uh, and engineers on our product, because they never had the opportunity to kind of see this live action. This is how people are using our tooling. This is what the attackers are doing. Like this is a real life dogfight, essentially. And I will say, having lived through all these different experiences where you know you just saw the attackers were eating our lunch, like we could see we were making a difference. As soon as they started executing, um, you know, new malware, uh, trying to move laterally to different systems to dump more credentials, and we were stopping them in their tracks, we could literally see the commands as they're typing and they're starting to get sloppy, and, uh, and they are starting to get what I presume to be quite frustrated, and then you see what looks like a shift change of you know, new people coming in, because now you have different command line sequences and different tooling that they're leveraging, uh, and it gave us so much information as to what was going on on the other side, and ultimately how we could work really effectively to prevent it. So, um, we left that organization just feeling like, yes, we got to win this time. Like, we have a win on the board. We learned a lot about how we're going to prevent these types of attacks going forward. So that was, you know, a fantastic success story. But clearly, the, these types of attacks are still going on, right? We are still seeing a, a consistent evolution of them. And so I want to fast forward now to 2021 and actually uh, last Christmas Eve. So, and I'm sure many of you are aware that attacks never occur on a Monday morning or even a Monday afternoon. They're always Friday at 4 p.m. when you get the call and then you spend all weekend, uh, you know, working with this, uh, working on it. And this case was, uh, you know, a holiday, uh, obviously in a big holiday weekend. So what we've seen, um, I want to kind of, I've been talking a lot about nation states, so I want to shift to ransomware and cyber criminals because uh, that's really kind of the, every story in the news. It doesn't mean that nation state actors are not out there, uh, that they're not operating, but ransomware actors are causing a tremendous amount of disruption to environments throughout the world. And so uh, we got the call last year, Christmas Eve, and uh, ultimately, this was a healthcare organization, and the attacker was Black Hat. And so if any of you are familiar with Black Hat, they gained a lot of, um, informa a, a lot of notoriety, I should say, during the pandemic, uh, it, because they're really known as being very ruthless. They're specifically going after healthcare organizations, hospitals, when people were, you know, when hospitals were obviously overloaded uh, during the early days of the pandemic. And so um, we knew what we were getting into, and ultimately, this organization, by the time they called us, patient care was already uh, being impacted. And um, they were at the point where they realized they didn't have the data. It was not backed up. Uh, and what they had, uh, what they did have backups of, was going to take an, an inordinately long time in order to restore the data. And so they felt like it's going to be uh, much more effective in this case if we pay the attacker. And so we, uh, start negotiating on behalf uh, of the organization, working with the attack group, and it, it became very clear that this attack group felt that they were doing this company a great service. They felt like they were essentially another consulting firm that had entered into work, albeit without any contract, uh, but had entered into work with this organization and was identifying vulnerabilities and that they should be paid for that and for helping remediate them. Uh, and so we worked to negotiate uh, down quite a bit and then asked the, the attackers, you know, hey, in order for us to provide payment, we have some stipulations and requirements as well. So they ended up providing us an incredibly detailed remediation report that had full recommendations for different types of products that this organization should implement, everything from EDR to, uh, you know, different firewalls to the way they configured their backup settings. Uh, they, interestingly, in this case, sent a thank you note to the CIO after the case, uh, after the, everything was said and done, and said, you know, we really hope that we didn't disrupt your holidays. 
um, but your organization was so pleasant to work with. We look forward to you, you know, continuing to improve your security. Um, and that was the first time, I will say, that we've seen a thank you note from a ransomware actor to the organization, um, and it's just kind of wild. And so I want to talk a little bit about kind of what's got us here to this, um, to this stage when we talk about ransomware actors, uh, and there's a few things. But the onset of the pandemic really changed the game for ransomware actors. If you envision, you know, when uh, many of us left our places of employment and went home and started working from home, we're kind of figuring out, well, what, how do we even make this work? Um, attackers who I think previously had a day job and would only be able to conduct the rest of their activity, um, you know, for their moonlighting side job in the evening, now all of a sudden had a much more flexible work environment. Probably, you know, at home where they've got multiple computers and multiple screens uh, and can now be a lot more efficient and effective. And so uh, ransomware actors in particular really went after streamlining their businesses so that they could make them run much more like legitimate businesses. So delegating different types of work, um, you know, delegating the actual creation and the coding of the tool sets, the hosting of the infrastructure, um, they would just say, hey, I'm just gonna outsource that to someone who already, you know, is a hosting provider. Um, the outsourcing, it's, in some cases, even the negotiations and communications that occurred. And what that enabled them to do, and then certainly, you know, I mentioned the coding, but like just buying tools that were available and could work and included customer support from the coder and enabled the actual attackers to get inside an environment and start operating much more like nation state actors where they were slowly collecting information, observing, uh, you know, how the company worked and observing where is the data that's gonna um, essentially make me the most money if I steal it. And so uh, we saw just a really increased professionalization of these attackers. Uh, what that then resulted in is they created multiple uh, payment schemes. And so no, no longer was just I'm gonna exfiltrate data uh, or, you know, encrypt data, excuse me, and ask you to pay for that. But two, I'm gonna steal it, so I'm gonna exfiltrate it, much like a nation state actor would do. Um, and that, in that way, if you don't wanna pay me for, uh, you know, for it, like say you've got backups and you don't need it, um, I'm gonna post your most sensitive data online and embarrass you publicly and attempt to destroy your reputation, and I'm gonna ask for payment that way. Um, three, I'm gonna potentially, uh, now while you're trying to defend against the ransomware attack, I'm also gonna threaten you with a DDoS attack against your environment that makes it even more chaotic for you to try to respond. And then lastly, I'm gonna select pieces of the data that I uh, stole that's the most juicy and most sensitive and send it directly to your high profile client. So that client that's paying you all this money to protect them against something, I'm gonna take that and send it to the CEO and let them know what a wonderful job you're not doing. And so, you know, we've seen this result, uh, not only in the prof professionalization, but obviously like exponentially year over year, increased average payments, increased average ransom demands. Uh, and then you get situations like what I'm talking about um, now in the sense where, uh, you know, you have this attacker that no longer is some kind of rogue being on the back end. They take pride in the work that they do. Uh, they set up a client service portal, very similar to like if you, uh, you know, have ever had an order uh, on Amazon that gets lost, for example, and you click through and you're like, I need to, you know, re report um, a stolen package or a delay with this package. And it creates, you know, a service portal that opens up and you have presumably, you know, the bot on the other end that you're talking to. These guys are staffing it with real people uh, on the back end that are like, hey, I'm going to answer, you know, hey, thank you so much for initiating connectivity. What can I do for you today? You have a question? They're like, oh, if, you know, uh, we've actually had an attacker say in the case I just um, presented, um, I can't answer that question, but in five minutes my colleague will be online and we will immediately get back to you with an answer on this question. So it's kind of wild, but you see that they're very proud of the work they do. And I think in many cases, they feel like they're providing a legitimate service that should be paid for, right? We, ha we had this come up with a case just in the last few days, um, you know, where the attackers said, hey, this organization spent X amount on attempting to defend their security. Um, 
we are asking for a fraction of that, less than 10% you know, of their annual spend uh, for our proposal. And you know, we, we got quite a kick out of it. We're like, your proposal is an extortion attempt on this company. Uh, you know, it's not a legitimate contract, but uh, it's really been, I think, a pretty dynamic environment over the past few years when it comes to this threat landscape. And I imagine we're gonna see even more of that over the next few years. Um, so the final case I'm gonna present today uh, is also quite recent. And uh, you know, I'm, I've hit a lot on the themes of collaboration and communication and sharing information. And not only important just between responders, certainly when it comes to threat intelligence and analytics, uh, you see that with the war going on today. I think that there is more information being shared uh, within the cyber domain than we've seen previously. Uh, you know, in the wake of the Log4j attacks, I think you saw a lot of information be shared from the government, so DHS, CISA, uh, and many of their counterparts sharing with the private sector in ways that haven't, uh, and leveraging commercial tools like Twitter, for example, or GitHub, um, ways that many developers and analysts and responders are already working. And so I think we are starting to really see some improvements there. And uh, so this last case I'm gonna present, uh, I will say, along with the line of sharing threat intelligence, I think one of the uh, areas that I'm most passionate about is the ability to actually impact some change here. And if, we have an, if that means we get to put a criminal behind, behind bars, then even better, because in the cyber you know, domain, that's been pretty intangible for some time. And so as we move to this on the, in the private sector and not just in the government, uh, I think it gets pretty exciting. So uh, this case also began in December of 2021. So we, uh, we uh, December and the holidays, certainly very busy time for attackers. Um, and then as such, really busy time for our teams. Um, so when we got the call, which was in December, we identified that the attack had actually begun in November. And uh, we started to, to talk to the client. We actually jumped on the phone and this was within 30 minutes. Uh, started to get a rundown of, you know, what information do you have? What do you know about the case? And what do we not know? Uh, in this case, the sysadmin uh, could not access a file that they should have been able to. And that was their first indicator. And he thought, something is weird here. And he started going into the system, saw that there were some files um, on that system that he had not created that he didn't think should be there. So we got this call and uh, it, our questions and the information they had immediately directed us to four servers. Uh, and those four servers were actually located in Lithuania. Uh, this client was called us uh, from, a, from Denmark where they were headquartered, but their team was actually located in Lithuania. And the servers ended up being uh, just publicly hosted there. And we, uh, unfortunately for the attackers, have a really close relationship with the Lithuanian CERT. So I'm, this is a, you know, we've moved on to a Unit 42 case study now, uh, clearly, and one of the areas that we have strengthened are these international relationships with both law enforcement and threat intelligence uh, agencies, both in the US and abroad. And so we quickly got on the phone with our um, colleagues there, and they identified the four systems and um, pulled the data, uh, you know, replicated it, we got uh, access to do analysis, and we quickly identified that it's not only the files that they have stolen from our client, but actually now 30 different companies across 20 countries that these attackers are using these servers for. And so we then worked with uh, Interpol and they very nicely took the systems offline for us, um, you know, put them in an evidence locker, and we were able to start churning through the data uh, as quickly as possible so we identified that you know, the stolen data was on these systems, uh, a bunch of tools. So a tremendous amount of tools as well as um, you know, just um, protocol that the attackers were using in terms of how they were um, sequencing the, the file transfer, uh, where they would take it to next, who were they communicating with. And so we started to get a treasure trove of information. And, um, this was going to be unfortunate for the attackers because they had no idea why they all of a sudden didn't have access to these systems. So we had a lot of questions about, 
you know, do they, so obviously they removed and, you know, a lot of the stolen data and it's sitting on these servers, but is that the only place they have the data on or does it exist elsewhere and, you know, we simply don't, we haven't found those, the, those locations yet. So the next day, the attackers come at our organization um, with their opening negotiation and they tell us they need 1.2 million US dollars in Bitcoin. Uh, so we're like, well, hey, great, you know, we'd love to have a conversation with you, not really, but we're, <laughs> we'll have the conversation with you, but we're gonna need you to show us proof of the data. Um, we knew we had access to all the data they had stolen, but did they still have it? And so, as you might imagine, uh, they don't have it. So they start stalling, and what this gave us was, you know, if you can kind of envision the scene where our teams of analysts on the back end are going through tech, doing all the forensic analysis, all the technical analysis of the data we have, but then our teams that are communicating with the attackers are really getting an opportunity to see, like, how do they operate and work when they're on their back feet, right? When they're not in the position of leverage. And so uh, we thought, well, we're gonna engage and just see how far along we can get. And so we continued to ask for proof of the data. Uh, they continued, uh, they started with some technical difficulties, someone was out, they couldn't access it. And then they start actually um, negotiating with us. So we've never given a price other than, you know, their 1.2 million. We've never said anything other than we're not able to pay that. They immediately, or within the, I think, 48 hours, cut it in half. So go from 1.2 million to 600K. Um, from there, they decrease to 400. And we've still never countered any, you know, of their um, attempts. And so, in, uh, that's good news in terms of negotiating, right? We're letting them continually set the price point. Um, and so they continued to try to work around and say that they, you know, we're just having a system offline and we'll get access to it. Um, so it gave us a good opportunity to understand, like, they didn't know what happened to the data. They didn't understand why they, uh, you know, didn't have access. And so, as you might imagine, while we're working this case with them and finding this out, we're then sharing all the information we have with these other 30 companies whose data has been stolen. So we're working with them, and then we're sharing, I mentioned it was 20 countries, so we ended up getting to work with a lot of different law enforcement agencies, um, everyone from Europol to Afropol, back to the FBI in the US, and share the data. Um, the one thing that we didn't have, uh, we had all the data from all these organizations, uh, but no one had the decryption key for this attacker. So this was a new, um, a new scheme that they were using. So we ended up ultimately going from the 1.2 million uh, to $100,000. Uh, and that essentially was then being able to use for the decryption key that was shared with organizations throughout the world. Uh, as well as law enforcement, so that these attackers could not monetize the, you know, this um, attack as well, and it really kind of disrupted their financial model moving forward. So we considered it, you know, when anytime we can save one of our clients' data, but to not only be able to do that for so many other organizations, but as well uh, be able to provide this information to law enforcement, who, uh, with further analytics, now is being able to track that to actual individuals uh, that they're building cases against. So pretty fantastic. The other thing that we were able to do is take the TTPs and certainly build into our technology. Um, and in particular, our XDR tool identified four other organizations where this attack was attempted within the first week uh, of being able to, uh, being able to uh, have those new indicators. So, I think you know a lot of information that is par has parallels and very closely aligned certainly with the analytics that uh, you and your teams are doing today. So I'd love to open the floor to Q&A, any questions people might have. Um, and also if you wanna connect with me afterwards, you're certainly welcome to do that online. But thank you for your time. I have a feeling you
One of them in the related, one of them, ah, here we go. One of them um, is about richer data that you're able to draw upon. You know, you went from the very crude printout data to, you know, now you've got endpoint telemetry and other stuff. And <clears throat> so I wonder how you think about, you know, is enough data now available? What, what about the headaches of sort of synthesis of it and, and the privacy concerns and so forth? What's the pace at which richer data will be there? And related to that, at that last um, incident, which was really fascinating, um, kind of pivoted on that relationship with the uh, Lithuanian uh, sea cert. And I was thinking, if, if you hadn't had that, very different sort of outcome. So what's sort of the pace of, or what's the forecast for how those relationships with these various teams to facilitate things will evolve? So how do you picture both of those kind of evolving okay. over the coming years? Okay, great question. Uh, okay, so the first one just related to the data sets. Um, you know, as an investigator, I am always gonna want all the data, right? Every piece of data that I could ever possibly get uh, you know, Richard Baitlick and I worked together at Mandiant and we would constantly have this conversation, right, about we need more, we need to store this for as long as possible because we don't know when we're going to be able to, you know, go back and access it. I, I think there are certainly some tools out there now that are doing a, an effective blend of, you know, data storage on the back end from a forensic capacity, but keeping the, you know, costs and lower. That's always a challenge and a trade-off. Um, but I think the bigger challenge is what you hinted on with, is the correlation. So, um, you know, I'm gonna just positively assume that the data sets we need are there, right? That there's tooling in place where we have, you know, uh, endpoint telemetry, we've got logs, we've got network data, um, but now we've got to combine all of it. And I think only the most, um, it, we, you know, kind of use this term of above the security poverty line or below. And a lot of organizations that are above the security poverty line, meaning they have the ability to invest in tools, they have, uh, whether they're open source or whether they're uh, a combination, right, of commercial tooling, uh, tooling that they've built, and then they have employees that are trained and, you know, have processes in place to use all of this. And we're still only seeing, you know, a, um, a minority of organizations in the world who have the ability to have that level of sophistication and orchestration. So, then the telemetry, certainly the tooling exists today, but configuring it all properly and then having the ability to resource manage it um, in a way that you can correlate it at the speed of an attack, still challenging, right? Many organizations are doing that really well, but that's still the number one challenge that we see. Uh, the case I mentioned with the extortion attempt just this past week, uh, that organization had fantastic tooling in place, uh, but they had the logs, uh, they had a third party organization who was managing the technology. They didn't have enough employees, it was understaffed, and they were getting a ton of alerts, uh, and all the uh, you know, attacker activity was detected, but they didn't have anyone reading and reviewing the alerts and then making a decision on it. So unfortunately, that's still happening time and time again. Um, your second question, alongside of like the evolution of it, of commute sharing, it, remind me, because I kind of yeah, got so a little lost. It, it, basically, the, the pace at which we expect that to change, and at a high level related to it, these relationships that you were able to leverage. Yeah. And, in, in you know, establishing those is hard, and it takes a lot of time, and it, whether you've got a sense of, we're at a good point now, there's a whole ton of work to do. If we do the work, we'll be there in three to five years. I, I know it's really hard to sort of forecast, but it, I'm just looking for your sense of what can we expect in terms of things getting better over what yeah. time frame? Uh, I think we're at a better point than we have ever been. Uh, now, obviously, you know, we can look back and have, uh, you know, our lens be uh, 2020 in reverse. That said, I think we've had a few, a number of events that have contributed to that. So solar winds a couple years ago, Log4j, uh, Microsoft Exchange Server Vulns, and uh, now a war going on where cyber is at the forefront of that. And what that's forced is government to work much more closely with the private sector than they ever have before. And it's also encouraged uh, competitors in the private sector to be sharing information more rapidly than ever before. So, uh, you know, our teams have had 24 by seven 
uh, since early December, uh, a, a command post and a team that's dedicated specifically to Russia and Ukraine activity. Uh, we, as part of that, we're on the phone daily and on Slack daily with CrowdStrike, with Mandiant, with so many different competitors, as well as all our government relationships, sharing information so that as soon as we detect something uh, that's new, that could be an early indicator, that's not only being put into our products, but also our competitors. And um, I think that's a great place that we're in. It's uh, absolutely unfortunate that a war is what is driving that behavior. Um, but I think that that's the you know kind of reality. The more that cyber warfare is kind of brought to the forefront, uh, I think the more advancements we're going to see. And you know, in terms of, it's certainly not only our company that's got these very strong relationships with certs throughout the world, with intelligence agencies throughout the world. Right, you're seeing a lot more of that, and I think that's going to drive even further advancement. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Mandy. Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about what attackers do with data taken in ransomware cases. I was wondering if you can say a little bit about the same kind of data theft, but in a nation state um, sort of setting where, you know, maybe the data is sufficiently bugged that you can track where it goes afterward. I feel that oftentimes there, there is sort of this fact that data is taken and that's sort of the end of the story and you don't really hear what happens after. Yes, uh, I'd love to say that, like, yeah, we've got embedded, you know, telemetry and tracking and, and data that's stolen. But, you know, the reality is we often are brought in after the fact of, it, you know, a, an action has occurred and we're there to investigate it. Um, so there certainly are organizations that are doing that. Uh, I won't go into those details. I will say that. Uh, you know, I think we've got a pretty good understanding now, like it depends on which nation state actor, certainly there's some different motivations. Like if you're talking about North Korea, um, today they're actually getting quite into a lot of financial crimes um, because they need to generate income for the, co for the country, uh, you know, due to many of the sanctions that are imposed against them. Most other nation states, though, are not to that level of involvement in anything financial related. So it typically, is, you know, what appears to us is that they're collecting data based on some sort of defined objective or defined collection requirement, and then pulling that data uh, back in and presumably giving it to analysts who are then uh, pulling apart the information and providing it up to the powers that be to make decisions, right? Whether that's to rebuild a weapons platform, uh, you know, in the case of COVID, there was a lot of nation state activity related to not only the uh, vaccine research, but then the distribution in particular, right? How do we, uh, what, depending on the vaccine and the cold storage needed and the transportation requirements, how do we, uh, you know, how are organizations throughout the world effectively doing that so that, you know, presumably they could take the information back and share it um, to build out a process within their own organization. We've seen the same uh, you know, for counterterrorism activities, like nation state actors uh, targeting different parts of a police department in bigger cities to understand, like, how are they detecting threats? What are their processes? And then taking them back to replicate best practices. Uh, you know, so there's a whole lot of different, you know, avenues, and it really depends. Um, you know, certainly with Russian activity with the war, I think, you know, many of us have a lot of questions, a lot of concerns about, you know, what will be next. And they may have very different objectives than some of the other countries I mentioned. Got it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you, Andy. That was a great talk. So Thank I have two you. questions. One was like, when data or you know those kind of threat intels are being shared between companies, organizations, is that automated or is like you know there is a report, read the report and write you know your detection logic? Let you can say. Yeah, uh, great question. I think it's still not you know largely automated at scale because you're talking about different systems right, right between uh, different organizations. But I think a lot of the actual uh, frameworks for how we share the data. Uh, you know, and being able to speak in a, you know, common language, that's in, increased and improved so that we have more rapid sharing on the back end as we're building out different detection. Yeah, and second question was, was that 100 GB of data compressed or uncompressed? Well, compressed or not compressed, yeah. I mean, back in that day, I don't think it was compressed, but um, I think I also, for the sense of, you know, of telling a story, left it at 100 and it 
probably was a whole lot more than that. <laughs> uh, good morning, Wendy. Over here, sorry. Um, Hi. Bob with Correlate. So uh, just to contextualize the question, uh, about the time that you were leaving service, uh, I was working at the DOD CIO Cybersecurity Directorate for okay. about eight years. Um, and so just to contextualize kind of the have and have nots that you brought up earlier, um, I had a situation uh, a couple of years ago where on this threat sharing topic uh, or information sharing topic, um, I had a customer who was trying to get their threat information from a certain location and it wasn't working. So of course, you know, wanting to do the diagnostics, um, I attempted to get a copy of the threat information sharing and was told by that particular uh, source that I'm not a state and local entity, so I can't have it, right? So um, how does that work? How are you seeing that in your, you know, in your world now that, you know, when you, we had access to all this information that now we understand where tear lines are kind of in the commercial yeah. space, right? And so it's a little different. So how do you see that all working out so that maybe there's a little more homogeneity of getting the right data to the right people all the time as a national interest? And so, Bob, just to clarify, you're talking about a state or local government saying we can't share with you because you're federal government. Uh, more of an ISAC-related issue where the, the ISAC information wouldn't pass anything. It had to stay within the silo, right? So we, I was outside the gotcha. silo. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> you were um, an untrusted entity, it sounds like, at the time. Uh, you know, I think there's still challenges with that. Uh, we've made a tremendous amount of progress, but, uh, you know, and when we're talking about world events impacting change, right? 9-11. I mean, before then, the information sharing be between the FBI, other law enforcement agencies, the CIA, like all kinds of challenges, right? And we understand that with privacy concerns and privacy has probably only grown more complex and challenging since then. Uh, but it's a similar mindset in terms of that sharing. So I do think uh, we've advanced a lot in the sense that the you know cyber being brought to the forefront of real kinetic war is a change in lifestyle for so many people that the, um, that's why you're seeing so many organizations now be able to work together and share information rapidly. I also think, um, so not speaking to that exact example, but uh, you know, if you go back to Log4j and you see like that was the first time like DHS used Twitter, they used GitHub for a repository to direct people throughout the world to be able to say like, here's the latest um, patch, here's the latest update, here's these new versions. Um, and they, instead of saying, you know, the government's got to procure and make our own, you know, tool, we're going to just use what's out there and what the community is already using to do that. And so I do think you're going to see a lot more of that. We'll always have different, you know, pockets that are challenging, but, um, you know, I'd like to think we're breaking down more of those barriers. Wendy, a lot of our world is looking in the rearview mirror. What's coming <laughs> next? Yeah, um, always a great question. I think that one of the areas we're seeing that we will, I, I don't even know what derivatives will come from this, um, but you know, I mentioned like North Korea, now a country uh, getting into financial related crimes. And so we've seen them attack banks previously um, and be able to you know, ta uh, transfer money using SWIFT systems, for example, but we're now seeing them use ransomware to get in and steal money. And you're also starting to see nation state actors who are kind of saying, well, wait, those tools are a real good distraction um, for what my real objective is. And so it's starting to get where there's a tremendous amount of overlap and convergence in these tool sets. And I think we're going to continue to see that. That's only going to get a bit messier. Um, Probably, I think we say this every year, but you know, I always think there's going to be more destructive attacks, uh, you know, out there. There's certainly a lot of opportunity for nefarious actors to, uh, you know, to be uh, conducting those. So uh, that said, I think you're also going to see a lot more partnerships uh, in the, our community, and uh, certainly the announcement that's coming is really exciting for this community to, I think, see the adva advancement of more telemetry and what smart people can do with those data sets, um, being able to then pre uh, you know, prevent more attacks in the future and predict to a degree, you know, how can attackers take advantage of this and then build in mechanisms to be able to make that unsuccessful. Yeah, it seems as though we need to lower that poverty line um, almost Absolutely. to ground level, if not maybe sub-ground level, but we'll see if we can ever get there. Um, other questions? 
Um, just a couple of questions about the ransomware ecosystem. Um, are payments completely dominated by crypto now, or still is there still a mix of crypto and you know pre-crypto payments, you know credit cards, totally wire transfers? Totally crypto. Totally crypto. Yeah. And do you think the um, again the ransomware ecosystem has evolved in, in a different way with crypto being the the uh, an option? Like like if crypto had not existed, do you think it would have evolved differently? Probably. Um, you know, I think that, I, I think attackers would still find, you know, creative and ingenious ways to move money quickly, uh, but it certainly, you know, hampered uh, international law enforcement's ability to track it and prevent it quickly. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw last week, there was a, um, an attack, I think it was Binance, uh, that lost five, I want to say it's $567 million dollars. Um, in one of their crypto wallets. Attackers had figured out essentially how to replicate and create new uh, wallets, so it wasn't like a ransomware attack, but they used different kind of technology to go in and you know, steal that much data or that much money. Um, that's a huge amount of money that's gonna have a real impact on a, a company. And so I'm really curious to see between um, you know, the challenges with crypto, between different government regulation and communication through, from different governments throughout the world, like what kinds of impacts can be made. Um, you know, I think, again, attackers are always gonna find a way to do something new, but if we can you know, keep the low-hanging fruit uh, and prevent as much as possible that way, then that's ideal. Thank you. Yeah. So considering cryptocurrencies are really a mystery to many out there, do you think that's part of the equation in helping organizations that don't really understand how it works to be ready as part of their disaster recovery plans or incident response plans is to understand crypto well yeah one of the things that we really encourage organizations to do not only to have you know a very detailed plan and understand you know how you, I, I could probably talk all day about right how we can who you need to communicate with and make sure you've got on speed dial and you have their number on whatsapp and not just email and all of these things one of the areas we would focus on is that you have real conversations with your cfo um, uh, regarding how do we work through this like because there are organizations who will you know have pre-planned internally we could pay um, it, you know a ransom up to let's say one million dollars but then so it's one thing to have the approval um, and it's a it's a good thing whether you're gonna pay or not or have no approval it's a good thing to have already had that discussion and know that decision but for organizations that are gonna say we might keep something in reserve how are you actually gonna pay? Because you have to have the ability to pay it in the you know, type of circumstance that the attacker is looking for. And so you don't necessarily wanna be setting that up on the fly in the back end over a weekend, you know, that kind of a thing. So having relationships with organizations that can help you provide some guidance through that is always a good thing. Other questions? I think we have time for one or two more. Folks online, if you've got questions, please put them in the Slack channels and we'll relay them out here. So Wendy, you talked about this being warfare. So how do you think that nations can use their knowledge of warfare to translate into the cyber world, right? So you're, you're talking about we're, we're moving and they're acting in a coordinated method. They're using a ransomware attack as a diversion for this real attack or exfiltration of data over here. That's a warfare technique. How can nations use the knowledge of warfare to help private sector combat the, you know, those attacks? Uh, great question. So uh, I have the um, benefit of being uh, working for DHS as well, and I'm, I'm on the Cyber Safety Review Board. So that's comprised of you know, the heads of cyber for NSA and the FBI, uh, many, uh, certainly DHS and CISA, and then there are six people from this, um, you know, civilian network, if you will, that are representing different organizations, and our first investigation was into Log4j, and uh, I bring this up because in the context of your question, one of the areas that became incredibly clear was that prescriptive guidance from the government, and in this case, DHS and CISA, 
uh, really helped many organizations be able to assign resources over a holiday weekend, have them work kind of, uh, you know, for better or worse, as I'm sure many of us were doing some of that work, um, you know, but working over uh, these in really increased timeframes in order to quickly get systems patched. Uh, and so I, f I say that because I think having a bit more prescriptive guidance is very helpful for some organizations um, to be able to mobilize resources and get things done. Uh, and then certainly to the degree, uh, you know, that you're talking about information sharing, uh, when it comes to warfare, I think one of the bigger elements that ties into this idea of, you know, those organizations that can afford good security or not um, is how much of us are dependent now upon this supply chain. So you could be, you know, uh, the largest financial services company in the world, and you might have 5,000 employees on your security team and your annual budget's a, a billion dollars, um, but you might still have some supplier that's really deep down embedded that has some kind of weird niche capability that's providing, um, you know, that has access into your environment, and if they're not equally protected, then we're all at risk. Um, and so I think we're starting to really see the challenges uh, that presents, and ideally from the warfare element, be able to start working together. Um, and I think it's gonna take you know, organizations that do have resources, not only to help fund solutions, but really for the information sharing, right? It, we have uh, you know, it, telemetry and analytics based on data sources we have that are unique and different than any other company out there, and we all need to be sharing those in order you know, to provide for the greater good. So I think we're gonna see that quite a bit as well. Is that it? Okay, you're the last one. No so pressure. make it good. <laughs> um, how do you view the importance of open source and, and what do you see that is currently closed, either content or proprietary software that's inhibiting our advancement in this fight? Ooh, the second part of your question, that's great. I'm not sure I'm the right expert to answer that, but the first part, um, you know, I brought up obviously Log4j, and so uh, with the Cyber Safety Review Board, we had five work streams, the first one being dedicated to open source software, and the second to vulnerability disclosure, which I think those two go hand in hand, especially when you've got, you know, a global ecosystem in Log4j, you had, uh, you know, a researcher in China who released it to um, the community, and so, all that said, we identified a lot of challenges just when it comes to open source. Uh, I don't, they're, they're not solved by, you know, private funded commercial software either, right? But you have clearly more of a distributed environment. Uh, you know, you don't have employees that are reporting into one organization and you have code sources that can be modified over decades in some cases. So I think there, that the open source community, one, is critical to all of the work that we do, but two, I think there's a lot of um, just kind of further maturity that we can that we need to figure out together in terms of the security side of that and what that means. I think for us it kind of raised more questions about how do we do this, you know, uh, effectively and together than knowing all of the answers, right? So I'd certainly love to pick some of your brains on that and what your thoughts are and how we can improve it. <laughs> 